In multiple regression, a possible problem is multicollinearity. This is where there is a linear relationship among all the x variables or among a subset. In the case where there's a linear relationship among just two of the x variables, that's what you call correlation. Absence of correlation, perfect correlation between two pairs of x's, your exponential variables, does not mean there is no multicollinearity problem. So the general definition, as I said, just rewind a few seconds ago. All right, so the question we're asked to explain is this consequence of the least squares estimator when there is perfect multicollinearity, severe multicollinearity. I'm going to break this talk down into four bits, give you a short explanation for people who just want to know. Then I'm going to delve into more detail and through that we need a little bit of linear algebra. So we're studying this the gram matrix x transpose x. I'm going to give you a quick example in Excel what, I, what, uh, what implication is of uh, multicollinearity and then we'll end with a geometric interpretation. So the quick answer is for part A, perfect multicollinearity means there's a exact linear relationship among your x's or subset of your x's. This implies there is not one solution to your least squares problem, there's going to be more than one. And in the computer output, if you don't run this, you may well get an error message if you have perfect multicollinearity. But more usually, if you have multicollinearity, it is severe multicollinearity. This is where you have near linear dependence. And what that means is it's going to make your estimates, your output, pretty unstable. That's like the kind of very loose way of saying it. It means if I run it for one sample and then I run it for a different sample from the population, I'm going to get very erratic, very different parameter estimates and standard errors and so on. We can say I can break this down to three bits of what you're going to have, what's going to happen. You're going to have large sampling variances. Another way of saying that you have high standard errors for the coefficient estimates, for the predictions. Also, you're going to have higher covariance between the coefficient estimates, and this means leads to more erratic estimates in any one um, sample, because high covariances imply higher correlations, and that means you know if one estimate is very big, that could lead to another estimate for another parameter being very big or very negative, depending on whether it's a positive or negative covariance we're looking at. So hence we could deal with lead to estimates with the wrong sign. Finally, we already said that the estimates are going to be set very sensitive to small changes in your data set to your x's. So all these three things concern what happens when you are running a regression on a sample where you have high multicollinearity. But uh, least squares, ordinary least squares, supposing that the other assumptions of regression are still satisfied, is still best linear unbiased estimator. Blue, supposing we don't have ex exact perfect multicollinearity. Because, you know, unbiased, uh, best and unbiased, these are words to do with repeated sampling. So we are just saying that in, um, in any samples, we're going to get pretty erratic um, estimates from one sample to the next. But in the long run, if you average all that stuff out, it'll pretty much be unbiased and uh, efficient. All right, so that's a short explanation. Now, to study it, we got to do some linear algebra. Here's the model then in matrix form. And the least squares estimator is given by this expression and the variance is given by this expression. We're going to suppose to simplify things sigma square is known, so just set to one, for example, okay? Now, in both beta hat and variance of beta hat, what we have here is this matrix x transpose x inverse. This thing x transpose x is a matrix. It's called the gram matrix. So central to the to what's going on is the study of this inverse of the gram matrix. And if my if I have a um, sample of n observations and p number parameters, then x transpose x is a p by p matrix. Looking at this variance uh, covariance matrix, because it's a matrix, you can see it's p by p, the diagonal entries will denote the uh, variances the estimated variances of the uh, beta hat, supposing I don't know what this guy is, uh, while the off diagonal elements will represent the, will be the covariances between the parameter estimates. So let's study what this 
matrix, the inverse of the gram matrix looks like for you know near cases, exact case, perfect multicolarity, and when we don't have multicolarity at, at all, zero level. All right. So let's say that I have a X matrix with three observations, two unknown parameters. So it's a three by two matrix. Then let's just calculate the gram matrix. That's how it goes. Okay, so it's that two by two matrix because this is a P is two. And then the inverse is that. Okay, just using this fact, or you can see it's a diagonal matrix, so the inverse is just one over each of the diagonal elements, but in general we'll use this thing here. Um just of something interest, guys, I'm not, we don't really need to uh, know how to calculate it. So I'll just tell you that the determinant here is 6, and we've got two eigenvalues, 3 and 2. Okay, so I'm going to note this x transpose x and that x and these things here, and I'm going to tabulate. I'm going to tabulate and create a table for various x. So I've got a column for x matrix. That implies x transpose x is this. The inverse of the gram will be that. The determinant will be this, and the two eigenvalues listed. All right, I've got these various cases. Uh, look, in hindsight, I should have done these in different color. Right, so I have three cases, A1, A2, that's one case. B is another case, C is another case. All right, so the A cases is to do with, um, basically, absolutely no multicolonality. This is what we call orthogonal design. So there is uh, no linear comb You can't multiply, since it's only two by two case, you're looking for, what do I mean by linear combination? I mean, multiply one column by a scalar to get the other one. Well, there's no number here to get anywhere near this, right? In fact, if you look at what they call the inner product, so this times that plus this times that plus, is equal to zero. So in other words, this vector and that vector, they are perpendicular. Uh, that means basically, they're okay, there's zero amount of multicolonality going on there. There's no relationship. Okay, that implies this, which I showed you. Now, let's think about what happens to the x transpose x inverse matrix when we just just change the data a little bit. So let's change minus 1 to a minus 0 0.9. Okay, I'm going to get this. Now let's compare these two. So remember the diagonal el elements represent the variances, supposing I set sigma squared to 1. And you can see they're pretty much the same. That's the first estimate and that's the second estimate. How about the covariances? Well, in this case here you've got the 0 you got zero covariance, that's the implication of being an orthogonal design. Whereas here, once I've changed it by a little bit, now I've got, you know, it's a very small covariance. Well, I say small, but, uh, well, if we standardize x's, then this would be a correlation. Okay, so in that case, it would make sense to say, okay, that's small. Why I'm interested in doing that is because the x transpose x matrix explain exactly about the three points I mentioned in part b about the large sampling variances, the high covariance, which is the off-diagonal elements, large sampling variances, that's the on-diagonal, the diagonal elements for x transpose x, uh, sensitive estimates, the small changes in x, so that's what I was just doing, just changing the entries in x a little bit. Okay, so let you bear that in mind as I'm going through these examples. All right, so in the, that's the, that case, then. it hasn't changed the variances much, covariance is not that much, so it's not gonna really change things that much in the estimates in that sample. Now let's compare B1 and B2 here, a case is where I have high but not perfect multicolarity. So you know, this vector is almost this vector. Okay, if you try to sketch it, this is one axis, that's another axis, that's another axis, and then these will be very similar, pointing the same way, almost aligned. In that case, I look at my x transpose x now, we notice the variance are in uh, suddenly, look, compared to before, you can see they're massive. How about the covariances? Well, the x transpose x will represent more or less the correlations between the x, it's two points, uh, covariance between the x, x transpose x, I've worked, and here it's, ma it's negative. So it's change sign and it's big. That's just, yeah. Compared to over here, it's big. Now let's just change this data a little bit. Let's change uh, the 1 up here to 0 0.9 and see what happens. Now we'll compare this to here. Can you see the variances have increased dramatically? Increasing the variance dramatically means, you know, there's more variability here. There's less precision in your estimate. So it's, it's gone up almost like threefold. How about your covariances also increase almost around threefold? 
So a slight change in parameter estimates has made everything a lot, uh, it's changed everything drastically. Your estimates, are basically your output, is unstable. That's what I mean by saying unstable. I'm going to come back to this example in an Excel spreadsheet in a moment. Finally, case C, this one is uh, where you have perfect multicolonality. Because look, um, this is just a multiple of this. Now, if we try to calculate the inverse, it's not invertible. There's more than one solution. So least squares breaks down. All right, so how can we detect for you know high levels of multicollinearity? Well, there's various ways. The most common way is based on looking at the inflated standard errors, how much it inflates by when you've got perfect multicollinearity, and they look at something called the variance inflation factor or related the tolerance. But if we stay in the uh, linear algebra world, we can just get it by looking at the determinant and the, examining the eigenvalues. So we know that if a matrix is not invertible, that's equivalent to saying that the determinant of that matrix is zero. Let's just look at this case. In this case is not invertible. Let's look at this uh, determinant. It was zero. And the determinant being zero is equivalent to saying that you've got at least one eigenvalue of that matrix, which is zero. We have the eigenvalues here is six and zero. We've got a zero. So in other words, just by looking at the value of the determinant or the eigenvalues, we can determine whether we have severe multicollinearity or perfect multicollinearity. You know, um, this kind of case where you've got near perfect multicollinearity this is what some sources call ill-conditioned matrix. For very severe multicollinearity, you can see the determinant is close but not equal to zero, and the eigenvalues you have one, at least one, which is close but not exactly equal to zero. So now we know multicollinearity is um, still best linear and biased estimate in severe multicollinearity, uh, but that's for, you know, if you repeat the samples um, over and over again, got the output over and over again, things will kind of even out. But in any kind of sample, you get very erratic estimates from one sample to the next, although they even out. So let's go back to case B1. You've got, let's say, sample three observations. It's just a play example. So this is what I had just make up the y's, let's just say it's that. Alright, then we get this, um, two parameters. The slope estimate is minus 10, the estimated intercepts is 13, below is the corresponding standard errors. So you can see they're both insignificant because you know the t statistic for testing for the individual significance is to take the estimate divided by the standard error. Well that's less than 1 in absolute value, this is less than 1 in absolute value, not significant. They're different from 0 statistically. Okay. And then we just change this one here, just change this one into 0.9. Look at that. It's gone, the estimate, parameter estimate has gone from minus 10 to basically 0, minus 6 times 10 to minus 14. That's a dramatic change. You know, so it's very unstable here. I mean, if you had just changed the data by a little bit like that and you get such erratic behavior, that would make you very think about your output as being very unreliable. Yeah, it's been, that's, that's the problem. Estimate of the intercept is 13, it's massive change to 4. I say massive, you know, you put it in a better way, look at the factor increase or percentage change. Standard error, 16 is inflated. 15, it's gone to 30, 30, it's inflated, higher variances. Okay, well, I could prolong the conversation here and talk about, let's do the case for the first example and just make this orthogonal and uh, just see the changes and you're going to find very little change, okay? Uh, let me just go back up here. Right, you see the command here. You can try try this in Excel if you like, or just try it in some programming language that you're more familiar with. That's uh, good to kind of play around to understand this issue. Now we understand that multicollinearity leads to erratic uh, output from one sample to the next. Um, that's good. But lo do, looking at it from linear algebra point of view, we can also get in, gain an insight by looking at the geometry. So let's go back to the current example where we've got two parameter estimates, um, two parameters, model of two parameters. So I've got two covariates, that's a, that's a vector x1, that's a vector x2. This is a y vector of observ observed value in n by one dimension, in n dimensions. Okay, so drop the line down to the space spanned by the two columns, that's perpendicular, that's the shortest distance from this space spanned by the x's to what y. And then this vector here, I'm is y hat. 
it's the shortest distance to y given the x's okay and you can see like that is a unique combination of the x1s and x2 that gets me there because you can see this is a parallelogram law rule so b to 1 hat b to 2 hat are the estimates now let's consider this case so this is this this case here is where i can see that they're, they're either um, absolutely perpendicular right angles or that there is some degree of multicarnality but there's not perfect multicarnality now this here both x1 vector and x2 vector are basically aligned they are this is the case of perfect multicarnality and you can see it's the same issue go by here drop it down to the right angle here that's a y hat but now the issue here you can see there is no single unique solution linear combination of x1 and x2 that gets me to this vector this point here because I could take any kind of linear com well I say any so that that's the amount that works gets me over here for example if you set the parameter estimate on this guy to 1 this will be something so that when you add these together it will get me here set that to 1 change that uh, uh, put a coefficient in front of there so you're going to get to this point I set 1 up to 0 and then this whole length will be that one see so there are several there's more than one solution in the case of perfect multicollinearity so I'll leave you with this then that you can understand about multicollinearity is all through this matrix the gram inverse of the gram matrix